my approach has always been to just keep it simple. You know, the least amount of tools that you have to use, the easier it's going to be for you to work fast and quickly and get that idea out in onto the paper. This is the Pencil Kings podcast where we talk to artists that are doing cool stuff. Today's guest is doing some very cool things, teaching people how to improve their portrait drawing. And we're going to talk a little bit about his technique and how he discovered that. So I want to welcome Kevin Kramer to the call. How are you doing today, Kevin? Hey, I'm doing uh, pretty good. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing awesome. I'm in. I'm still in Singapore. Um, the the sun is shining today. It's not raining yet. We're in rainy <laughs> season, so we get some amazing storms. Um, but yeah, it's been a good day so far. And before we get started, um, do you have a place where people can go to see your artwork? So if they're listening, they could maybe look it up and be browsing and, and kind of see some of the amazing portraits that you've done while they're listening. If you go to drawing and coloring blog dot com, if you just put dashes in between each of the words. There's a gallery on there, and it it goes through the portraits that I've done on there that are the kind of the hyper realistic, and you can take a look at them on there. Sweet. So it was drawing dash and dash coloring dash blog dot com, correct? Right. Yeah. It's a it's a, a little bit of a mouthful, but it gets there. <laughs> awesome. So to start off, why don't we talk about how you got started? How you got into art? Were you always drawing and doodling as a kid, or is it something that came about later on in life? Yeah. I mean, I think most artists are kind of well, I mean, at least for me, I started drawing the, the Looney Tunes characters and like movie posters and the VHS back in the day when I had the, they used to have like the blank boxes that you could buy for the movies that you, I guess you lost the covers for. And I would take those videotapes that we had and I'd draw the poster cover basically, or the, the movie cover for the new box, just so we could kind of have uh, some kind of nice box for the movie so i kind of started drawing anything and everything that i could find that was blank or something that i could just copy (laughs) that's kind of really where i started i started doing that when i was probably about eight it started way early at that time were you obsessed with creating the most realistic drawings that you could or were you just drawing for fun i always did kind of have a sense of i want to draw it as much like what I see as possible, whether it was a cartoon or like a high detailed face, it really didn't matter. It was like, it was almost kind of an obsession with perfection, <laughs> but it really didn't matter what it was, whether it was simple lines or something highly realistic. I always tried to replicate it as much as I could. Yeah, I ask because uh, I feel like we're, we're similar in that regard. I remember being a kid and I have these uh, comic books with, it was a ninja and I was trying to do... Uh, hand-drawn animation as like a t- eight-year-old kid and, and I feel like my mom must have been so frustrated trying to help me out draw this thing because I just was not happy with it at all and obviously trying to draw a full figure like doing this jump kick uh, in <laughs> perspective you know, with God. foreshortening and coming towards the camera is just like <laughs> you know it's pretty advanced there's, for there's a, a lot kid. of what things going on there <laughs> Yeah. So you progress through, you continue drawing, and then it, it, what, what did high school look like for you? I, I'm guessing by that time you were starting to be known as the art guy in your in your classes. It's funny because in middle school is when I really kind of met my match. I've been friends with him ever since, but it's kind of started up as a rivalry. I would draw something and then he would draw something and then people would like talk back and forth. And it was just kind of like <laughs> some rivalry that was just created out of nothing. So we were just drawing and just drawing cartoons and stuff like most people and then in high school we got into the same art class and that's really when my competence I guess just took a sharp upswing because I was just surrounded with a bunch of awesome artists and they all just raised the bar of what I had to do and that's really where I started focusing on uh, portraits really. There was another kid in class in high school. He was just, he won the like the state award for uh, Black History Month. And it was all over the museums. And just the definition and realism in his drawings was just outstanding. And that just, it really just kind of pissed me off, really. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of picked his brain and took a, a few of his techniques and that's really kind of where I started developing and seeing what was possible and what I didn't know really. And then from high school, where did you go once you graduated? 
I went to LSU for a few semesters, but I couldn't really figure out exactly what I wanted to do because there's graphic design and then there's, you know, the studio art and all of those things. And it kind of just, I didn't really have a a lot of good uh, guidance on that, I guess. So I just really got frustrated and I stopped going for a while, but I always kept drawing and I always just drew faces and it didn't really, I wasn't really attracted to much else other than just faces there's so much expression in them and just so much that you can capture you know even in eyes and the mouth and everything it just has their own individual expressions that you capture when you draw them and that's really what I got hitched on in high school and kind of just went with it after that and so while you're kind of realizing that university or college might not be for you did you have any doubts that you know am I doing the right thing with these portraits like is there any future in it or what what was your headspace like as you're realizing that the path that you thought you should be going down is not the right path for you you know it's kind of a tough um road to go to be just a full-time artist there's so many different things that are up against you really because you're if you're in that creative space that creative mind you're not necessarily thinking of a a kind of a business aspect of it and it's it's hard to switch gears with that so it was always something that I would have liked to do and I always kept doing it and I entered contests and I entered a lot of um like grant type programs to see if I could get like awards, but it wasn't anything that I could just see as that's the clear path. I just, I guess I just never really jumped all into it. Like my friend from middle school, he is more of the guy that kind of just goes by the seat of his pants and just that's, he's, that's what he's doing right now. He's kind of all in. And I never really got into that headspace of, I can just do this by myself full time and make the kind of living I wanted to do. So it was kind of a, a, a little bit of a frustration, but that's kind of where I got into the kind of the self-promotion and stuff like that. And it kind of brought all of it into the same world. But again, it's still that shifting of gears from creative to business type set. Why don't we change uh, topic a little bit here and uh, let you, give you a chance to talk a little bit about your technique? Because we, t- uh, you know, we met um, I don't know about a month ago now in person, mm-hmm. and you're telling me about your portrait technique, and I thought it was quite interesting because, uh, well. I will let you explain what's <laughs> interesting about it, and um, uh, I think I hope that from listening to this, that um, our listeners can t- have some takeaways that might help them improve their own portrait drawing, especially in regards to the tools, because this is a question that comes up a lot in email, and I always say, you know, don't worry about the tools, but you know, people do worry about the tools, and I know that you um, have specific pencils for for specific tasks and use them in a certain way. So, yeah, I I just love to hear, um, you know, in your own words, how how you're able to create such realistic portraits and, and what exactly you do. Right, right, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, again, that's with my site. A lot of a lot of people get hung up on the tools, and I think that's with anything that you do. People just want to know what are you using, so I don't have to even mess around with all these other things that don't work. My approach has always been to just keep it simple. You know, the least amount of tools that you have to use, the easier it's going to be for you to work fast and quickly and get that idea out in onto the paper. Really, it started with in high school again with the that guy that won the super like statewide arts uh, contest. I was using the ebony pencil. If you're on the site, the BB King picture, that was done with ebony. And that's where I first started getting into like really high contrast and kind of playing around with that. The more that you simplify the tones, the easier and actually the more realistic the pictures tend to come out. Because, I mean, if you ever do that trick where you look at something and you squint your eyes and it kind of just all the detail falls away. That Mm -hmm. is where like all your tones are. So if you can just simplify all the tones that way, 
you only need like what I use is I only use like four pencils to do all of that. So you can get all of those tones and you get more impact and you get more contrast and they overall just come out looking a lot better. So I use a combination of those and what I learned from that kid in high school, which is really just using uh, napkins. (laughs) That's really the big secret that I use is napkins and four pencils. Napkins. I've got a few questions on the top of my head, but napkins, uh, (laughs) I don't know what to do with napkins. Like maybe I'm thinking right now I could, you know, if I'm hot, I could use it to stop the sweat from dropping on the page. Clearly that's not it, but but how do you use napkins? Yeah, the the napkins were, once he told me that, I was like, are you serious? That's what you're using? Even, Even like a tissue or napkin or anything like that. Because I, you know, I was using those blending stumps. I don't know, like you know, they're made out of paper, or they're like those really thick ones that everybody uh, you can buy in like packs of four or five or like two dollars. That's what I did the entire BB King picture with. And then when he did his, uh, it was a Bob Marley picture, and he was using toilet paper and napkins with ebony, and it looked like a photograph. And I was like, what the hell? How? (laughs) So that is where I get like all of those nice blended tones is the four pencils that I use are 2H, 2B, and then a 6B, and then 8B to 9B. Those are kind of interchangeable, but those are really the only ones I use to get all my darks. I don't use ebony's anymore because they're so reflective and it's really hard to look at it. I mean, there's a lot of different techniques where people kind of use and play with that a little bit. But again, I just kind of like to keep it simple and straightforward whenever I'm drawing stuff. I can usually create those reflections and textures just by just drawing it skillfully. So those are really the only pencils. And then I take the the napkins or the paper towels. And if you... Just draw like a little circle on a piece of paper in the back of your notebook or something like that. And then I just take the napkin and rub it on there so I can pick up the graphite. And then I just smudge it around and get those those little tones and shades that I need that are just subtle that you can't get with maybe a blending stump or just a pencil alone. And then Anytime I draw something else, I'll just draw a few lines and then I'll blend them with the napkin too. So it kind of just is an overall nice, soft, and gives you a lot of good supple skin tones. Oh, that's so interesting. I have So you've got your piece that you're working on. And then beside that, you've got like your sketchbook or another piece of paper. And you've done like a really hard circle with, with a lot of like um, lead that's it's kind of like just sitting on the page there because you've you've done it and the circle's maybe about like a an inch and a half wide. I'll shade it in and then you've got like your your nine B uh, circle and then you've got your um, I think it was you said a two B circle and a four B circle and I'm assuming that the two H wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to pick up that much from the two H but maybe you can. I've, I've never tried it. Is that how it works? Well, I actually, I just use the nine B. I don't even. It really, any one that you can get a dark enough circle with to pick up the lead, that's really what I use. So I usually, maybe a 6B or a 9B, but I don't I don't like lay them all out in a nice gradient or anything. I, I just kind of get sloppy. And if I need some, I'll pick it up and then I'll put it on the paper. After a while, if you keep using the same napkin, you know, you don't even have to rub or pick up any more graphite. It's already on there. Then that's really where you can get like those nice, soft, subtle shades of... Uh, a tone on the paper. How would you apply more shading or less shading with the napkin? Is it just a, a function of pressing harder with your finger as you're rubbing it? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, really, it's just varying how much graphite you have on the on the napkin. If you need more, I usually I'll fill it in. Maybe I'll just do like a little scribble on the actual drawing itself and blend that in. But I make sure I use like a softer lead so it's not hard lines. But a dull pencil and a napkin will give you amazingly hyper-realistic skin. <laughs> but what about sharpening your pencils? Do you have any, like, do you use a, like a, a, one of those metal sharpeners or do you use a knife or anything special about that? I, I never could get, get down with sharpening my pencils with knives. It just seemed a little uh, old school and a, a little tedious, actually. 
Uh, I mostly just use just a little, those little metal sharpeners. I have like an electric sharpener that I, I use occasionally, but most of the time it's just one of those little, I think it's QM or KUM, one of those little sharpeners and that's really it. Yeah. Like I said, I, 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 I keep everything bare bones as possible. I put all of the detail and process into the drawing. Oh, that's great. I, it's actually so profound that you, I think, it, it's almost anything that you do in life. You start off, you don't know anything that you're doing, and then you learn these techniques, and you start applying, and you keep learning, you keep learning and applying more techniques, and then you find something that works, and then you start taking things away. Yeah. And then you, like, then you finally you get to this point where you know exactly what you want to do, and you have the minimum amount of tools so that you spend the majority of your time just creating, not like you know handling twenty different pencils or swapping things out or you know all kinds of outrageous techniques. It's just you know very very straightforward, and it's all about the creative process. The more you're fumbling around trying to find the perfect pencil or the perfect eraser, or for me anyway, I just lose I lose sight of what I'm trying to do. And for me, that's just not that important. Like, I don't, I don't draw with super sharp pencils. I don't have like 20 pencils sharp and ready to go when everyone gets slightly dull and I switch it out. That's just not the way that I draw. That's just not the technique that I use. I know a lot of people that do that and those drawings look awesome, but that's just never something that uh, I just never could get into it. It, it kind of was a more of a distraction than anything for me. Yeah, definitely. What's something that you see when you're looking at other portrait artists' work that's maybe not quite at the level that you're at um, that might help them break through to that next level? I mean, we've talked about the napkin shading, but I'm sure there's other things that you you see that people do over and over again that would, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they fall into that category, that they could maybe be, oh, wow, you know, I've always wondered what was wrong. But this is giving me some really deep insight into this common thing that I, I'm actually doing. And now I can go back in my next drawing and, and be aware of that and correct it. Yeah, definitely. There's one thing, and it, it took me a while to do it myself. It's actually something that I read uh, a few years ago that I got from one of Andrew Loomis's books. And it's to make the darks darker than you think and keep the lights lighter than you think. If you do that, again, it goes with that simplicity. You'll, your drawings will just have more impact and they'll just look more vibrant and lifelike. Mm, I, I can definitely relate to that as, as a really great piece of feedback. When you read that and then you looked at your own drawings, did you feel some resistance? Like, <laughs> you know, this dark is going to be too dark. I can't press that hard or I can't apply that much shading. It's just not going to turn out right. But then you did it and, it and it worked out. Oh, yeah, definitely. Before I even read that, I knew that I had to add more contrast and I knew that I had to just make it darker, but I, don't, I didn't want to mess up the drawing. It feels like I'm just going to mess it up. I put all of that time in, all that work. And the one day that I just said, screw it, I'm just going to, I mess it up, I mess it up. But once I did that, I was like, obviously, that looks so much better than what I was doing. Why, why did it take me so long to <laughs> flip that switch? Yeah, that was most one of the most enlightening things is just add more contrast. And don't be afraid to mess up the drawing to just experiment and grow and increase your process. I'm not a, a great digital painter, but I, I like to dabble. And uh, what, what I've been amazed at is how long it takes the professionals to, or somebody that creates a really you know, jaw-droppingly amazing um, painting, how much time they actually spend on it. Because I know for me personally, I'll draw for like an, or I'll paint for an hour and feel like, oh man, I've done so much work. I've been, <laughs> I've spent like a whole hour on this. You know, <laughs> obviously that's, that's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of things, but I see other people falling into this trap of not spending enough time. How, how long do you generally take on on a, a portrait that you do and let's just use a standard you know eight and a half by 11 legal legal document size you know fairly small piece of paper if you were to draw a hyper realistic uh, portrait on that size of paper how long would you say it, it takes you you know today being that you've spent years and years developing your techniques and, and becoming very familiar with drawing the human face so you're obviously at you know like a master level but but even so how long does it take you to draw uh, a, a finished portrait of that size uh i mean it's gonna take me still 
I mean, on the site, if you go there again, it, all those pictures that I usually am used to drawing are like 30 by 40 inches and those take forever. Uh, if I'm doing something about eight and a half, maybe kind of like what you said, I can still easily put two, three, maybe even more hours into that because it's done when you think it's done. There is a certain point where you do start to ruin something because you're just trying to teeter it and make it perfect. And at a certain point, you kind of just have to say enough's enough. This is good. And I need to stop or move on to another picture. I still, I can easily spend at least three, maybe four hours on a piece like that. I mean, it'll be done to my liking, but I could still find things that I would like to add to it. And then what about your your larger picture? So if someone's looking at the examples on your site and you're saying like 30 by 40, I think it was. Yeah. How long do you spend on those? Oh man, those are, um, those are a labor of love. I'll tell you that. (laughs) Those are each one of these was a very inspired piece, which kind of drove that work for the substantial amount of time. Uh, if you look at that big Alex piece, I'd say that took, man, that took a, a over the course of maybe six, seven months, maybe 80 something hours of work. Wow. Yeah. That was probably one of the longest because that was the first. If you look at that, I I actually, I used a similar process to uh, Chuck Close. That was my attempt at a Chuck Close with graphite. So it was kind of an experiment, kind of a uh, inspired by something else, but It was actually one of the first all original pieces that I drew from start to finish. And that, yeah, that took at least around 80 plus hours over a series of months. Man. So I guess like the the, sort of the moral of the story is that it it takes as long as it needs. But if you're if you're whipping these things out in an hour, you can probably take it a lot further unless you're just I mean, I, I have seen some people that they draw almost like a machine like they their their every stroke is so calculated and perfect cuz they've done it so many times before but um oh. yeah it's, i think i think it's a really important lesson especially when you're starting out to you know to not get too frustrated and just keep pushing through and um everybody works at their own pace my friend that i had in middle school when i grew up with him he was always super fast with his drawings it was i was always envious of that he was always super fast but i was always able to get super amounts of detail, which he was envious of. You kind of have to work with what you got. He uses oil pastel. He can kick out a picture that's 30 by 40 or similar in two days, and it looks amazing. And it's all color, which is a whole nother aspect. But for me, it still, I just, I can't work that fast. I just never could. It doesn't, it doesn't just click like that for me. So, I mean, Everybody works at their own pace. So if you see someone that's struggling that, or somebody that's going super fast and you're really like, oh, man, how does he do that? That There's something that he's doing or she's doing they wish that they could do that you're doing, if that made any sense. <laughs> oh, no, definitely. I, I really like that, that takeaway. I have something more, something none of your dry as dust professors and routine written doctors have. Love, devotion, passion. Now, I know you've got a, a course that teaches people your technique. Can you give people sort of like the two-minute overview of the different things that you teach? So if somebody's listening and they're like, yeah, that, you know, I want to take my portrait drawing to the next level, um, what the course is all about. Yeah, definitely. The course is uh, Shading Masters. It's got five modules where I basically go through, you know, I tell you, I break down all the tools that are available. And then I I also give you obviously the tools that I use, but just so, you know, just so you can have a round, an overall view of what's out there and what you really don't need. Then I will go into kind of learning light and how to view the things and simplify the drawings. Then I go straight into technique and teach you all the different methods and styles and different things that you need to get all of those different textures and tones without having 40 different pencils. It's just, it's just really, it's not necessary. 
And then after that, I'll go into how to create specific textures like uh, like glass and clothing and different things like that. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of bonus stuff in there, too, like interviews and a lot of different resources and tools that I have, too. So it's really just a complete overview of my process, the tools I use, and how to apply them. Awesome. And we'll have the link for that as well as um, your website to take a look at some of your art at um, pencilkings.com slash Kevin Kramer. That will be K-E-V-I-N-K-R-A-M-E-R. Um, what's the best way if somebody wanted to reach out and um, pick your brain? I mean, you can find me on Facebook. You can go on drawningcoloring.com's Facebook group. That's always um, an option. I get a lot of emails asking for like critiques and stuff. You can just email me at, let's see, uh, Kevin at shadingmasters.com. I get a lot of people that send me pictures for critiques and stuff there. So, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, those are pretty good spots. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the call, Kevin. I hope it was enlightening for those uh, listening. I think it was for me kind of realizing uh, this whole concept of using the napkin to to shade. I think it's something that you could you know, definitely hop off off listening to this and you know grab something you know even a piece of toilet paper everybody's got that and then just give it a shot and see what you can do um so yeah once again we'll have the notes the, the links to kevin's course and, and everything else at uh, pencilkings.com slash k-e-v-i-n dash k-r-a-m-e-r thanks so much kevin for being on the call thank you mitch it was great That's it for this episode. We'll be back next week with another fantastic interview with another successful artist. I'll see you there.